Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes, doctor. Yes, we are seeing. Okay. So, thanks again, the organizers and all the distinguished participants uh, for the opportunity to share our work with um, this distinguished forum. What I'm going to talk about today is um, semiconductor interfaces and nano composites characterization via terahertz cameraless imaging techniques. I'm Anis Rahman, founder of Applied Research and Photonics located in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And um, we mostly talk about this uh, terahertz time domain spectrometer technique and uh, cameraless imaging technique. So here is the outline. Uh, I will have to adjust in some cases. I probably will not be able to go through everything uh, here. But uh, the main issue is um, the problems that the industry faces in characterization, um, particularly when the nanomaterials and nanotechnology is to be used, then uh, it's not only the size of the nanoparticle that's important, which of course is, but also how the nanoparticles interact with each other and one kind of nanoparticles to another kind of nanoparticles, as well as with the bulk such as semiconductor wafers. And this is more important for from the commercialization point of view uh, because unless we know the properties and interaction properties and composite properties in the application world uh, is hard to come up with the, the specific applications. And then to be able to do that, we also need to just um, need to see or characterize a lot more than a single surface. Uh, we need to see in the depth, preferably without breaking and non I mean, non-destructive mode. In some cases, non-contact is also important. To give you some appreciation of this, this uh, technique, consider the case of the silicon wafer manufacturing. A blank silicon wafer, uh, you know, eight inch wafer or 200 millimeter wafer cost somewhere between 100 to 200 dollars. But when the thousands of cell phone CPUs are built on that single wafer, its value goes to million dollars or more. So this is a tremendous jump from the blank substrate to the finished products. And semiconductor manufacturers often find themselves in a situation that they have to throw away some of the processed wafer because some problem stayed you know, there are thousands of, I mean, uh, hundreds of steps literally to go through from the blank wafer to the uh, finished uh, uh, product. So it, if some of these steps or one or two of these steps uh, have problem, then the whole process becomes problematic. So the process development takes a long time uh, for, the, uh, for the products. It's very similar to pharmaceutical industries before they can bring a a uh, particular medication to market takes sometimes uh, five, 10 years, not to mention the billions of dollars they have to invest. Same thing happens in semiconductor industry. Uh, you know, a lot of discrete circuitries are being consolidated. So every day new ICs are being made, integrated circuits are being made, but that takes a long step. So uh, question, question is, 
what is the problem with current technology and what can we do to alleviate some of those problems. Currently, we have optical imaging, X-ray imaging, atomic force microscopy, scanning electron microscope, transmission electron microscope, focused ion beam, etc. So uh, what happens is, as I said, there are hundreds of steps. At every step, they need characterization, so they need multiple platform, multiple measurement, and uh, each of those instruments are very expensive. So the goal is to consolidate some of the characterizations on one platform or one instrument, as many as is possible. Uh, so nanometrology is one of the uh, critical thing here, which means that measurement on the nanoscale. Metrology means measurement. So how do we achieve non-destructive, non-invasive, even non-contact uh, measurement and imaging um, in, in, in a cost-effective, but more importantly, informative way. That's a challenge. So our company has been around since 2003, and this is one slide I have to use for the company, so forgive me for that. And the challenge was to image, you know, lattice resolution imaging with bigger wavelengths. And, and that is the crux of many scientific issues that the industry is dealing with. So as you probably know, Ernest Avi established in 1873, that the image resolution depends on the wavelength of the light and the smallest object we can image cannot be smaller than half the wavelength of the light that we use for imaging. So if we are talking about visible light like in a regular microscope, light microscope, uh, even if we are using UV, which has a wavelength of 256 or so nanometer, then uh, the smallest object we should be able to see is half of that, 128 nanometer. Now, as you know, the semiconductor industry has moved to 10 nanometer and even a smaller line width. Some 30 nanometer is probably the current state of the art. 30 nanometer node is the current state of the art. So, only way to um, see something is by using the electrons in an electron microscope, simply because electrons have a wavelength in picometers, uh, energy dependent, as 100 kilovolt or so, 200 kilovolt um, or kilo electron volt. If the electron energy is, then the wavelength is about 2.5 picometer. As such, uh, the diffraction rule still valid, and we can see, uh, you know, lattice resolution images. So a long standing uh, among the scientific community and engineering community has been that, is there a way to see smaller things with bigger wavelength? Or are we stuck with this obvious diffraction uh, limit? So since 1873, we are stuck with that, and uh, you know many groups all over the world have been uh, trying to overcome that. Uh, which sounds like a big deal, but as you will see, um, it's not so much of a big deal <laughs> because the question we ask is that is breaking the RV diffraction limit enough? And if you are thinking about non-destructive. Uh, and non-contact imaging to see under the surface where terahertz comes in, and I will explain that in a little while. So the terahertz radiation can penetrate a lot of surfaces except for metal, which is impervious to almost everything other than neutrons. So 
So if we have to use, um, you know, uh, a non-destructive technique to see underneath, then terahertz is ideal for many reasons. Uh, it is non-ionizing, so it does not perturb the, the atomistic lattice structure of the object that we will be studying. And yet we can see under the surfaces without breaking it. On the other hand, terahertz, radiation has a wavelength somewhere between five micron to three millimeter. So it is because it is in between uh, the infrared and microwave uh, on the electromagnetic spectrum. So with this huge wavelength, even if we are able to break the RV diffraction limit, which says that, you know, it breaks when you can image something smaller than half the wavelength. So if you're thinking about nine micron on the one end, or five, let's say five micron on the one end, and you are image, uh, let's say something up to micron, then, you, then we have effectively uh, broken the RV diffraction limit, but that does not help us to see the atomic lattice, to see the nanometer features of semiconductors, to see the interaction of one nanomaterial with another nanomaterial and so on and so forth. So as, Ostensive as it sounds, breaking the RV diffraction limit, uh, which of course uh, is a fundamental physical improvement, physics improvement. On the other hand, from the practical point of view, it's only one piece of the puzzle. We still have to be able to measure or image lattice scale objects with bigger wavelength. So that is the challenge, and her question is how do we do that? In our group, we have been able to achieve just that by a strategy that we deploy that combines these three main uh, steps. First is we use uh, a modified Beer-Lambert's law in terms of reflectance from objects. And I will show examples of the rationale of doing that. And then, we digitize an object in three dimension by means of a nano scanner. And then we uh, uh, deploy uh, one, one algorithm is called inverse distance to power equation to create a 3D uh, lattice. This lattice has a different meaning uh, than the atomic lattice, uh, but this lattice is simply a, a mesh up in three dimension. <clears throat> Then combine all of these things, we are able to uh, do the atomic lattice imaging. So, so why terahertz? Terahertz, as I said, uh, is between the uh, range of far infrared and in the uh, microwave. Uh, it is non ionizing, etc. So a lot of advantages we have. Uh, it penetrates under the surface, so we can focus it below the surface and image there or take spectrum there. Uh, and that gives us also ability to inspect something on a layer by layer basis. Uh, and so first then we need to generate terahertz. There are uh, obviously uh, more than one way of doing it. However, uh, what we use is what you call the dendromer dipole excitation. Uh, it, it doesn't need any femtosecond pulse laser, uh, and we can control both the bandwidth as well as intensity, a uh, very uh, convenient way. Uh, um, one of the pioneers in the field is, uh, in the field of nanotechnology, of course, uh, uh, Bob Carl uh, is a Nobel laureate, Harry Croto and David Smalley uh, in 1996, uh, and uh, this was a reception in 2007, uh, and after a discussion, Bob related to me that beta terahertz sources are important. So, so we started uh, doing that at that time. Uh, sorry, uh, so what we do is um, uh, we, we utilize the dendromer, which is a polymeric nanomaterial, we dope it with a given chromophore to create the charge centers. And when we excite that dendromer or dendromer dipoles specifically with a particular pump energy that gives out the terahertz radiation. That's the basic concept. And uh, why dendromer then? You know, because we can control the dipole population. 
And also the other thing is in, in, in organic lattice, the dipole uh, moment is a fixed entity. But in this case, we can also control the dipole moment because it then becomes a function of the charge distribution. And why is that important? Because then we can have a wide band or broadband uh, radiation out of that dendromer coming out in the terahertz range, which is almost not possible from an inorganic lattice. So here is our instrument, how it looks like. Here is the demo to a group of uh, uh, post, I mean, graduate students and postdoc at university. But uh, we have two ways of putting the samples. For small samples, uh, the scanner itself uh, will move the sample and uh, the instrument will remain stationary uh, so that we can do a nano scanning uh, step in three dimension. And um, in the, um, if the samples are bigger and, and sensitive, then uh, we, we have a way of fiber optic coupled circuitry where um, the circuit itself scans or the beam itself will scan uh, the object. The object is stationary, so the vibration problem can be better managed. So, so this is how the scanning uh, goes. As you can see, the scanning is done very slowly and, and simply because when you want to see the atomic lattice without using an electron microscope, then the scanner is more moving very, very slow. Um, and uh, because we collect 200 points per second only, so when the scanner moves uh, about uh, half a micron per second, we get much better resolution with that. So um, the basic concept then, how does the reconstructive imaging mechanism work or cameraless imaging mechanism work? If you compare with the camera, which is, utilizes a CCD, you know, think about the days when we had photographic films in a camera and we expose it and develop the film to get the image. And now we don't have to do that. We have an object and there is a focusing lens, which is uh, focusing the image on the focal plane array or a CCD or CMOS, etc. And then the ASIC built-in computer in the camera is uh, translating that signal into the image. Uh, in the in the cameraless situation, what we have is that uh, the scanner that I have just shown you, the scanner generates a 3D data matrix, and then we utilize our algorithm to generate the uh, image. Uh, so um, the advantage is that we can control the pixel size Unlike CCD, uh, where the pixels are constant or fixed by the CCD size, in this case, uh, we can control the pixel size from the, as, as I say, from sub nanometer or, or angstrom resolution to millimeter or, or even uh, bigger. Uh, in fact, in three dimension, as we call it, is a voxel size. And, and that's a user controlled parameter now as opposed to, uh, you know, the CCD uh, dictating the, the resolution. So here are the algorithms that we use for image generation from the 3D matrix. Uh, two things, uh, as I mentioned before, one of them is the Beer modified Beer-Lambert's law. Here on the right side, the Beer-Lambert's law is written in terms of the reflectance and uh, uh, the advantage is that every material has its characteristic reflection. Therefore, um, the, it, it becomes sensitive to just about any material, including soft tissue or semiconductors or metals, etc. And then uh, our scanner uh, is designed such that the um, the reflection, uh, the reflectability, uh, I'm sorry, the reproducibility of the traces are guaranteed. Because if I scan a particular feature and if it doesn't reproduce every time you scan it, scan it then the image will be different because it, the contrast is coming from the reflected intensity. So based on these two, uh, we go through this procedure, et cetera, which I'll not encumber with, but 
Uh, but here is a simple example that if I have a cos function, cosine function, and if I image that with our algorithm, do we get the cosine function back in three dimension? And the answer is yes. So uh, with that, let me, uh, I'll skip this because I'll come back uh, to similar, but let me give you a few examples. At this stage, I can stop for a minute and if you have any questions up until here. Okay, so now let me uh, share a few examples of this technology with you. Are, are, are you all there? Can you hear me? I cannot hear anything else other than me. Yes, me. Okay, wonderful. So a few examples I can go through and you can stop me anytime you wish. Uh, the, uh, one of the thing is the lattice dilation in nickel ceramic system. And semiconductor, inter in, uh, semiconductor interfaces, which is the today's main topic, then nanoscale metrology of other materials, as well as seeing the nanoscale interactions. Um, in a lot of times, we have to uh, deal with nanograins and nanovoids, quantum dots, epitaxial semiconductor layers, in which there are uh, physical defects such as stacking fault, dislocation. Etc. Uh, and uh, and other you know uh, examples in graphene and nano suspension. As I'll try, I'll stop when my time is up. So please alert me. As a summary of images, um, just one slide. Uh, on the on the left, you see the um, uh, alumina nanostructure. Alumina is a amorphous is an amorphous material. But amorphous doesn't mean that everything is haphazard. When you see under microscope, of course, everything uh, you know so it shows different. But when you see really close, there are still lattice structure, except that they are not very organized. Uh, and on the on the upper right here, we see the uh, two gold nanoparticles next to each other. We can see a lot more closely. Um, on the uh, lower left, uh, we're seeing several layers of a sample, so we can image layer by layer or analyze layer by layer, and so on and so forth. So let me go actually to the first example I want to talk about is the lattice imaging uh, where we quantified the lattice dilation. So the, ex the, uh, the experimental material is a spray deposited, uh, plasma spray deposited uh, layer of ceramic on which layer of nickel was deposited. These are all few microns thicker. So uh, we have non-destructively scanned and imaged. And then the, uh, the, uh, the objective was to study uh, up and if under the experimental conditions, the lattice structure uh, going through any change, such as lattice dilation. So if you look at this uh, very left image, which is like an AFM-like image, then we can isolate the metallic area and, and the uh, amorphous area, which is a... Um, um, uh, which is the ceramic here, cer deposited ceramic here. So our goal is to take the uh, metallic area and uh, zoom in uh, step by step. So when you zoom in on the metallic uh, rich area, we still see that some ceramic has caused perturbation in the, um, in the metallic lattice. So then we, we, we focus on some area where the only metallic lattice is pronounced. And now we can measure the lattice parameters. Uh, and, and then we can zoom further in uh, to, to see them more clearly. So this is all uh, on, the, uh, on, on, on the sample 
uh, let's see, I don't have a exact picture of that sample. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the, <clears throat> the rightmost one is uh, 100 nanometer by, uh, this is 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer, right? Most one is probably 10 nanometer by 10 nanometer. So what we have found here in this case, I'm sorry, uh, that's the second. Uh, what we found is that when we, uh, we, we first image the metallic nickel to establish the metric, and metallic nickel has a lattice structure, which is widely known, 0.35 to nanometer or 3.5 to angstrom. Once we established that, then we characterized um, four different uh, uh, nickel, deposit and nickel structure that went under the electric stress. And then we quantified the lattice dilation. As you can see on this rightmost picture, the lattice are not this kind of little bit, uh, you know, haphazard that you, you can make out uh, visually. And then we actually can measure it uh, and quantify them, which was done. We actually published these results, uh, which I don't have the reference here. Second problem I want to deal with, I want to share with you, is the semiconductor interfaces. So interfaces play important roles in all semiconductor fabrication processes. Interfaces are complicated because of inherent unknowns. And what are they? Uh, let's say I am depositing one material on top of a silicon wafer. Then silicon is, of course, very well characterized. But the depositing substrate, I mean substance, even if it is metal or polymer, they undergo the depositing process, uh, meaning that from solid to uh, either vapor or some cases even liquid, and then back to solid again. So this produces, this process produces uh, defects such as uh, the, the lattice structure uh, may have the stacking faults, dislocations, or the interface between the two material even though they are known very well on their own, the interface may have different structure or properties. So that is the thing we are trying to understand here. For example, where we have a silicon substrate on which we have a particular material which we are calling layer two, and then on which we have another particular material which we are calling layer one. So this structure is sandwiched of two different layers on top of a silicon substrate. Um, and here are some of the images. So, so on the upper left corner, uh, you see that particular sample, the uh, film side is to facing towards the, uh, the reflectometer where all the measurements are being done. Uh, so from the outside, when I, I focus the camera, you know, that the shiny thing is, is not the sample. The sample is on the inner side, which we cannot see under this situation. So first thing we did, we, we tried to uh, measure the thickness of the first two layers and, um, uh, and the first, the orange patch that you see on the top is about 80 nanometer and the dark uh, strip just below the orange is about 10 nanometer, which we were able to verify with other techniques. So they are in very good agreement. But uh, as you can see here, the upper right image shows that the surface of the top layer is not all that perfect. So we want to check more carefully how does the um, interface look like. Um, so, So before we take very close uh, image, we, we looked at the surface texture, which is a, over a you know one micron uh, by one micron by one micron area, uh, and uh, then we zoomed into uh, this is a hundred nanometer cube, one hundred nanometer by one hundred nanometer by one hundred nanometer. Uh, on the left, the three, three dimension, as you can see, different. Uh, uh, layers have different uh, structure, lattice structure. Some of them are bigger, some of them are lattice-like. 
So now, if we if we look at only one face, which is on the on the picture on the right on the middle, then we can measure the you know the layer thicknesses and their characteristic. So layer one uh, here, as you can see in the graphical analysis, is uh, about 14 or so nanometer thickness. Uh, and then there is a layer two with the totally, totally different kind of structure. Then there is a layer three uh, and, and layer four. So this actually, uh, so this is a different sample actually than the one, than, than the one I thought we were characterizing. Uh, what is uh, important is here is if we see very closely, then you can see the interface between the top layer and the layer below. Uh, and this interface is a, this is a very nice uh, deposition process that created very nice uh, uh, interface. Some cases it is not so clean, not so, uh, and, and we can quantify that as well. And then if we look at the nanograins in the films, it's um, uh, the very top layer was a metallic film of the sample, then, and then there is a carbon, uh, layer, so each of these uh, nanograins now can be quantified. Um, and some cases, this is a different sample where there are nanopores, purposely created nanopores, and the nanopores were measured, imaged and measured uh, for, for quantification. Uh, here is a, um, a two different carbon material deposited, uh, which was supposed to be a high density on the left and a low density carbon on the right. So there are, you know, missing materials on the top on both, both samples, which can be quantified as well as their different properties and interactions can be quantified. Um, there is another example of um, nanoscale interactions. This is a uh, work in collaboration with the Los Alamos National Laboratory and uh, published in Macromolecules. Paul Welch uh, is uh, and his group. Um, um, ab about 10 authors are on, on this paper. Here's the reference. But the problem that we solved here is that um, they are making the a hierarchical ordered polymeric ionic liquid or ionic polymer, so to speak, which have been impregnated by a particular kind of quantum dot in that matrix. So they have the X-ray diffraction data, which I'm not showing here. I'm only showing mostly imaging part. Uh, to cut the long story short, this is a TEM image of the, uh, of the quantum dots, which is what is the same uh, we have measured uh, very similar to what we have measured 11.29 nanometer versus 11.1 nanometer, which is perfect match. And then we, what we have done is how the quantum dot organizes themselves in their polymeric matrix. So this is not an obvious characterization. Uh, and, and that was the basis of publishing this data. But as you can see, uh, on the left, upper left corner, as uh, synthesized quantum dots inside the ionic polymer matrix. And then on the upper right corner, the, uh, the sample was soiled in deionized water overnight. So because of the soiling, the, uh, the structures are uh, a lot more uniform and, uh, you know, uh, organized, so to speak, compared to the unswelled sample. So from this image, th these are all 3D images of which uh, we are showing only one uh, face at a time for quantification purposes. And the picture over here, uh, the uh, second picture from the, uh, from the right on the top, that is showing the details arrangement of the polymers <clears throat> and what are uh, uh, and the quantum dots. So the quantum dots have organized themselves in a hexagonal closed back um, uh, crystal structure, and the polymers and water has formed lamellar uh, structure uh, on the on the uh, on the lattice scale, on the molecular scale. 
So these are the things that we have been able to <clears throat> study uh, as well as quantify. And these are industrially uh, important applications. So I will skip this stuff. Uh, here is an example of how we go layer by layer. Uh, uh, one last example I will share with you, I would like to share with you is uh, this um, uh, nano suspension. Uh, particularly it's a slurry which is made by, uh, uh, which is made by, <clears throat> excuse me, um, nano silica particles uh, suspending in, uh, in a um, um, IPA. Um, isopropyl alcohol is the suspending medium and the silica nanoparticles uh, have been suspended in there. And this is used in semiconductor industry for polishing purposes. So the, in, uh, uh, the manufacturer gave us this uh, specification, the particle size should be 10 to 30 nanometer, uh, silicon dioxide, which is glass, and their uh, weight percent is uh, 10 to 31, uh, 30 to 31 weight percent. Uh, less than 1% water, viscosity, et cetera, et cetera. So the issue here is that uh, if I dry them and, and put it under ACM, um, then we still get some um, image, but the particles then do get agglomerated. And the size is not exactly what they are expected. So the question is, can we image them while they are still in suspension, we want to measure the particle size while they are still in suspension. So we made this experimental uh, setup, as you can see here, there's a short path length cubit uh, in which we put this slurry. Uh, here's the path length shown in, in red arrows between the, the two, it's about one millimeter path length. And, and then we uh, put it on the, on the this, this is mounted on the, uh, this uh, nano scanner. And then we have imaged them. So what we did, we first imaged blank qubits to show uh, that they are indeed very amorphous uh, material. Uh, and then we focused inside the qubit and imaged about, um, uh, five cubic micron uh, uh, volume. And uh, then we focused on, on upper left corner, one cubic mi micron. It still looks very amorphous. And then when you look very, uh, I mean, you zoom in to 100 cubic nanometer, 100 by 100 by 100 uh, nanometer volume, you can see that the nanoparticles are kind of agglomerated in small nanoclusters and they are separated by the IPA layers. So we now can measure the particle size as well as cluster size and, and all other things. So if we take a single particle, it's uh, at about 10.75 nanometers, which is within the range of the uh, specification that was given by the manufacturer. And these nano clusters, sorry, I, didn't, uh, I wanted to show you this, this nanocluster at about 18 or so nanometer, which was not visible uh, until we did this kind of imaging. So uh, let me now come to close. Um, this alumina, one, one thing here is beta alumina structure, as you can see, nanograins, um, uh, all of them have their own crystal structure, uh, but they are still amorphous because none of, none of the crystal structures are the same. Uh, and then there are nano voids. Uh, this, uh, you know, two nano voids marked here A and B. As we can quantify them, the nano void A is 2.78 nanometer, and the other one is only 0.72 nanometer. Um, I'm not going into the details, so let me. <laughs> sorry for the. I didn't have time to just tailor the presentation. If you have any other questions, please feel free to ask. But in conclusion, uh, what I would like to say is that RB diffraction limit uh, overcoming is important, but that alone doesn't give us the ability to image small things or lattice with bigger wavelength. 
So the strategy that we have come up with is the uh, is a modified Beer Lambert's law in terms of the reflected intensity, and then use the uh, nano scanner to uh, scan an object in three dimension, and then utilize the scanned re in, uh, reflected intensity matrix to uh, uh, through an algorithm. Uh, to form the image, which can be a lattice scale resolution. Uh, and this has, um, uh, gives, this gives us the ability to quantify the nanomaterials and nanograins and nanovoids, not only for their sizes, but also their 3D structure and their interaction uh, among themselves and with other nanomaterials. With that, I thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions. If you have any questions, please proceed. Please proceed. Yes, I have the questions. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please yes, go I ahead. I can hear you. Please go ahead. Well, when I uh, talking about the uh, quantum dots, it's a very important parameter that uh, the homogeneity in size. But in your case, you have shown the uh, pictures. There is no any uh, homogeneity in the quantum dot. And that is a problem. Uh, and another way, you, you are talking about the layer by layer. If you are taking the layer by one mono layer, it's possible for epitaxy. So that you have non-destructive measurement that you really have the uh, uh, one monolayer that in thickness of this you know it's very well just take the book test books and you know so that's uh, 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 that's the way uh, to uh, to know uh, uh, the thickness of monolayer and then the grow the structure with the, by uh, layer by layer technology if it's possible. So that's well, very important uh, question. Sure. Question. Sure. Mm -hmm. So let so me address, let uh, me address one, at uh, one at a time. One at a time. I, I don't know why so much why echo, so much but, echo, but uh, 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 consider the quantum dot first, quantum which I actually escape instead, instead of answering. Instead of answering. So here is the silver iodide quantum dot we worked with uh, in collaboration with Kitagawa uh, at um, Kyoto University. Mm -hmm. so, so this sample was um, synthesized by the Kitagawa group and we, we characterized. So first, as you can see, the XRD uh, data that shows the particles shows are the about 11.4 plus minus four and a half nanometer. Okay, with that, with that, then we, then we, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's too much. Oh, plus this is right. This this is not our sample. So we only characterized. We did not make them. We did not make them. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. right. So, so, so our job now our is: job can, now we measure, can we measure? Can we image and measure image this quantum dot, quantum dot for what their size is? Their size is. So here is a three-dimensional so view, view of the of image, the image. Uh, which is actually uh, which is only actually 100, 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer. 100 nanometer. 100 nanometer. And as you can see, and most of the quantum see, dots are on the surface. On the surface they did not uh, go down. All of them, or, or all almost all of them, them are on the top layer. On the top layer. So, if we, so if we take the graphical, take analysis, the graphical analysis, and this particle, this one of them on the lower bottom, as you can see, we measured its size measured about 7.7 .7 nanometer. 7 nanometer. So it's a smaller, so it's a smaller than, what than what they reported, but they have a bigger have error bigger as well. 11, 11 plus minus four and a half. So when you subtract so four and a half from 11, it becomes within this range. 
we also uh, see that you know when you uh, when you analyze more than one particle, you can then establish the statistical uh, you know error bar, which we, which is not uh, shown yet. But you know the nano uh, also the nanoscale quantum dots are zero dimensional material. They are not supposed to form network among themselves. And that's exactly what we see. They are isolated on their own. So, so I don't know if that answers your question on quantum dot. And if I may move on to the other issue. Other issue. That's okay. Thank you. What was the other question? What was the other question? Oh, other one was on architecture, right? right? Yes. Okay, so I also skipped that uh, from showing the details. So this is a, uh, the image, uh, as you see on the upper right corner, is a TEM image published by IBM showing the stacking fault in silicon germanium layer, which was uh, deposited by Epitaxial Technique. So we got this sample from IMEC. Uh, on which they have two samples on which they have this uh, on the left silicon substrate and epitaxially grown germanium buffer. And for the second sample, on top of germanium, they have silicon germanium layer. And they shared their TEM data with us, which shows that the silicon germanium layer is about 18 or so nanometer thick, thick, and the germanium buffer is about 600 nanometer. So we created this image. On the left is this uh, germanium buffer on top of silicon, and on the right, the CG layer on top of germanium. Now we can quantify them. So we see that germanium layer is about 590 nanometer, so which is very close to their 600 nanometer. And the silicon germanium layer is about 18 nanometer, which is what they are reporting. So, so that is the question I had for you that the epitaxial layer by it themselves don't form the quantum dots, but you have your heat treatment which is a clever way of forming the quantum dots. And then we also have seen the stacking fault in germanium, um, as well as dislocations. So all of this, again, by our, without using the, um, the scanning technique, not electron microscopes. Okay, thank you. Sure. sure. Thank you. Any more questions? Any more questions? Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, that's all yeah, for the day. That's all for the day. We don't have any don't presentation yet. Presentation yet. Thank you for your participation, you for everyone. Your participation, everyone. All presentations are very good and informative. We'll meet you again tomorrow. Again tomorrow. Stay safe. Have a good Stay day. Safe. Have a good day. Signing Thank off. You. Signing off. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>